he finds out in quotes uh, in the lawyer's office that he's inherited the money. And he immediately starts to run over. I need to call my wife and yeah. tell her this is great news. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this might not look so good, huh? And then Wilfred's like, I wouldn't think so. No, uh, I bet they'll be arresting you any moment. And he I'll looks look- out the window and there they are. <laughs> here they come now. Uh, coming to get you right now. <laughs> uh, Sheriff, we're in here. Come on in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Today's Movie Verdicts episode of Lone Star Lawyers on the Varsity Podcast Network is brought to you by Varsity Search. Varsity Search specializes in helping prosecutors look for hostile witnesses whose marriage to the defendant she's going to testify against is suspect or, oh, oh, sorry, no, uh, let's go back on that. <laughs> We're getting ahead of ourselves. Get to the movie. Varsity Search specializes in helping small law firms in Texas hire lawyers and build great teams. So if you're thinking of making a move or your law firm is looking to hire Please go to varsitysearch.com and book a time to visit right into my calendar. Varsity Search, building great teams. Guilty or not guilty? The answer to that question is the end of most mystery stories. But in Witness for the Prosecution, it is only the beginning of a series of climaxes that I defy you to guess. You'll talk about this picture all right, but you'll never tell the ending to your friends because you won't want to spoil their excitement and their fun. It's time for Witness for the Prosecution. Witness for the Prosecution. The most electrifying entertainment of our time. Mrs. Vole, do you love your husband? Linda thinks I do. Well, do you? Am I already under oath? We are dealing with a capital crime. The prosecution will try to hang your husband. You killed Emily French. No, I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't kill her. I never killed anybody. The question is, Frau Helm, were you lying then? Are you lying now? Or are you not, in fact, a chronic and habitual liar? Damn you. Damn you. Leave her alone. Damn you. Do you find the prisoner at the bar, Leonard Stephen Vole, guilty or not guilty? Of the murder of Emily Jane French. Guilty or not guilty? The answer to that question is the end of most mystery stories. But in witness for the prosecution, it is only the beginning of a series of climaxes that I defy you to guess. You'll talk about this picture all right, but you'll never tell the ending to your friends because you won't want to spoil their excitement and their fun. And then, wow, they in are... text, notice to preserve the secret of the surprise ending, no patrons will be seated during the final 10 minutes of Witness for the Prosecution. Wow. They were serious they about, were this, uh, about this ending. Um, wow. All right. Daniel Hare is back with you here with Robert Callahan. Hey, hey. Wait a minute. Come on, man. Just, just one time. Just say just. Baylor Baylor's lost. Own, Baylor's proud. Ba- Baylor, Baylor's, Baylor's fine. We'll, it one day. We'll <laughs> practice. Just practice. We'll get it. <laughs> we'll get it next time. We are here to talk about witness for the prosecution. Now, if you have not seen this movie, you should just probably stop right now and go watch it, yes. and then come back and listen to it. Because you know we're, we're we're I mean it's it was made in 1957. There will be some spoilers in here. <laughs> You've had time. You've had time. You've had time. But in fairness to you, I was not aware of this movie before we started doing this show. Me neither. No. And yeah. so I totally understand if you haven't. That's why I've given multiple warnings through the other shows we've done up to this point and online to warn you that this episode is coming so you can go watch it before we release this. But um, but, but we say that because it's so good. It is. And there are so many twists. This is, this is sort of like the 1950s. Uh, version of the sixth sense all right and so like you don't want to go through the movie and then find out that bruce willis is luke skywalker's father (laughs) okay so like you you want to know you want to you want to you want to do it in in time uh appropriately without any spoilers or anything like that it's so worth it so many twists absolutely it was um it, it is based upon 
an Agatha Christie short story, and the and the story that she wrote was original. She wrote it in 1925, so this did not become a movie till much later. And she wrote it under the title "The Traitor," and it was T R A I T O R Traitor, and was uh, later published under "Witness for the Prosecution" as the title in 1933 in the UK, and then later in 1948 in the United States because you know this is pre-internet. This is you don't just publish and publish. This is like you got to publish it in the different countries. Snail mail, and then as a play. So it was a short story first, then it was a play in London in the early 50s before it became a film. And so uh, it was, as we said, released in actually in the United States anyway, in uh, uh, February of 1958, um, starring Tyrone Power as Leonard Vole and uh, Marlene Dietrich as Christine Vole or Christine Helm. Um, and then <laughs> Charles Lawton uh, playing the lawyer uh, who we should properly, I suppose, uh, refer to as a barrister right. um, in, in, in England. And uh, Elsa Lanchester play, playing his nurse, Miss Plimsel, um, who also actually, funny enough, Elsa Lanchester is and Charles Lawton were married. They were hmm. for like 30 years. Um, so they are playing their spouse in real life and they're playing um, patient and uh, nurse in this movie. Uh, she uh, also uh, is maybe no, most known for Bride of Frankenstein yeah. and a couple other things, obviously, um, and had a long career. Um, and so uh, this is directed by uh, Billy Wilder, who uh, is a six-time Oscar winner. Uh, the Apartment is a 1960 movie that won uh, him best uh, directing, producing, and writing. Um, and then uh, Sunset Boulevard and The Lost Weekend, he also oh, wow. won for writing and directing. Okay. Uh, so he is a six-time Oscar winner um, and voted 24th greatest director of all time by Entertainment Weekly fairly recently. So he is... A, a, and I, I should say, too, he's got quite a story. Uh, a, a Jewish man born in Poland in 1906 actually planned to be a lawyer huh. and then uh, changed course to journalism. And then later as a screenwriter, his mom, his grandma uh, and his stepfather were all killed in Nazi concentration camps. Oh man! Um, he immigrated uh, to Paris and then to the United States, spoke no English, was on the oh. breadline in <laughs> California um, before teaming up with his writing partner, uh, Charles Brackett and, and actually then returned uh, to Germany as a uh, colonel in the U.S. Army Psychological Warfare Division after the war ended uh, to try and save the German film industry. What? So this guy's amazing. This is amazing. Wow. And so uh, shout out to Billy Wilder. Yeah. I mean, obviously, a, a, he got plenty of accolades in his day in terms of as his uh, as a director and a writer. Um, but, but pretty amazing stuff. And he also directed and wrote some of the comedies of the era, including, uh, some like it hot with Marilyn Monroe, mm -hmm. which is an all timer. Um, and, uh, he collaborated with Steven Spielberg on Schindler's list and almost directed that himself, but he was already wow. kind of past retirement. Uh, so good, uh, good stuff from Billy Wilder who directed this movie. It was Nominated uh, for Best Picture, this movie was, uh, and Best Actor um, for Charles Lawton and Best Supporting Actress, uh, Elsa Lanchester, Best Director, uh, Billy Wilder, Best Sound and Best Film Editing, all. It did not win any awards. Wow. Uh, it was nominated for all of them. And I actually looked up. So the, uh, the movie that won that year, you will probably not have seen. It's 1957, 1958. You don't know how old I am. The, I don't know. You don't know me like that. I, I don't. The Bridge on the River Kwai. Oh, I have seen that. Oh, there you that's, go. That's where the... Dun, 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 yeah, dun, 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 it is. Dun, dun, is that where dun, that comes dun, from? I've not seen the movie. Dun, dun, I just, dun, dun, I watched about, I, think so. I watched a trailer for it to kind of get a sense of what it was. It stars William Holden and Alec Guinness, Obi-Wan. Oh, wow. Old school Obi-Wan when he's a younger man. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it won the Academy Award that year. So uh, this picture... Uh, Witness for Prosecution did not. Elsa Lanchester did win the Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actress, uh, mm. though. Good for her. This movie is number 71 on IMDb's top rated movies, period. No lawyer, nothing else. It is 71st on the all time on the IMDb total list. Number five best lawyer movie. Wow. And it is 100 from the critics and 95 from the audience on Rotten Tomatoes. Accurate. And it is uh, one that if you are a lawyer out there and you have not seen this, um, it's one, as we said earlier, that you should see. Um, <laughs> 1958, 
That's a different time. Yeah. <laughs> Man. We're going to talk about what's going on in 1958. Yeah, and you can see it. <laughs> yeah, I think you can. We're going to fail all your tests, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, for sure, we're going to fail the uh, the racial test. What yeah, was our racial the, test? The Callahan hair test. The Callahan hair test. That's going to fail. All there has to be. Yeah, we'll we'll go there. We'll yeah. talk about that. Oh, we'll get the minute. Okay. Yeah. We're going to fail all those, but we'll <laughs> so set those up. No <laughs> expectations there. Uh, NASA is established in this year. Um, and uh, Arnold Palmer is winning his first Masters. <laughs> <laughs> Barbie dolls are introduced this year, and hula hoops became a national craze. Um, a couple of the top songs of the year, At the Hop by Danny and the Juniors, um, and Get a Job from the Silhouettes. <laughs> so those Good are fun. Hope. kind of Yeah. At the Hop. All right. Uh, again, we're not going to play those, um, although maybe we should have instead of singing them ourselves. We're just going to pretend like I didn't hit that low <laughs> note a minute ago, too. Uh, let's see. I, we said this earlier. I, obviously, we weren't alive when this movie came out. Um, and I had not been aware of it before we started. Mm -mm. Um, so I had no context for this movie at all. Mm -mm. Um, other than I knew once we started looking into it, that it was a highly rated legal movie. So, um, what are, okay. Just before we get into the nitty gritty here, just your kind of overall impressions, the themes of this that you're, you take away from it. What are kind of the big picture messages here? Yeah. So man, maybe nothing is as it seems. Um, and that's true, not just in terms of plot, but just in terms of, um, the characters within the story and, um, man, you just, you, as lawyers, you can never just rely on the surface level of what's going on. Hmm. And so this movie really surprised me. I had super low expectations. <laughs> I was super nervous. I was like, I mean, anytime a black and white movie, I know, you know, it started, you know, slow, and they're in the 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 courtroom there, and like, you know, all rise, and here comes the people in the wigs and the robes, oh, yeah. and I just, oh, I yeah. was so nervous. But this really surprised me. Yeah, showed it to people in my office. They're hooked. <laughs> um, didn't get to finish the whole story, and so we we're going to be watching it this week. It, the people in your office have yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have. Yeah. Well, well, <laughs> uh, yeah. We came prepared for that. I wouldn't bluff. <laughs> right. Should we talk about the difference between barristers and solicitors? Absolutely. So it's the key thing in this. Yeah. So shout out to Cecilia Ibarra Burgess, uh, one of my friends in the UK who is a solicitor, I believe. And a um, little research that I did online. So the way I understand it, basically, a, a solicitor is the English version of a paralegal. They are, they are considered lawyers. They are behind the scenes. Um, they do a lot of paperwork, um, uh, just administrative things. They can argue some things in front of magistrate judges and, and the like. Uh, barristers are full blown lawyers. Um, they go to court, they wear the robes, they wear their wigs, um, them and the judges, that's still something that happens today, apparently. Yeah. And so I did ask the question, what if you're black and you're wearing, you know, the robe, do you wear the wig? And the answer is yes. Wow. Even today. Probably. Although in criminal cases, uh, there's some indication that that might change in the somewhat near future. Hmm. Um, so really interesting. Um, it, it looks like that the difference in training is that... Um, I, I don't want to get this wrong. I, I feel like I read that there's a year of law school, basically, mm -hmm. and then there's different sort of apprenticeships and tests that they take. Yeah. And one apprenticeship is two years, and that's your barrister, and the other one is an additional year, yeah. and that's your solicitor, and so that's the difference. Yeah, and, and so it's... Uh... It's a, it, I say it's key. I mean, it's a, it's a distinction made in this movie, particularly because, uh, yeah, Sir Wilfred is a barrister and he's going to be the one that argues the case. And Mayhew is the solicitor who uh, the defendant first goes to for help mm -hmm. and who brings him to Sir Wilfred. And then they work together essentially to, to work on the case. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, one of the things that stood out to me, um, just and this is coming from a person who 
is a lawyer but doesn't practice is Wilf, Sir Wilfred's love of the law mm. and love of the practice. Yeah. He <laughs> starts this whole thing basically coming out of, I mean, they say coma. They also say heart attack. It's yeah. not quite clear exactly what he yeah. had, but it's the, or, or maybe it's all of it. Um, and he's been there for weeks. Right. Uh, and um, he's supposed to be retiring. Yeah. And um, they can't keep him out of the game. Don't stop to get it. <laughs> they cannot keep him out of the game. And and he, I think, knows for his own health he needs to stop. He's mm-hmm. sort of halfway at the beginning attempting to stop. And he's trying not to take this case. He's trying to call up a, and refer it, basically, to someone else. And he just can't help himself. Every time it's a new piece of the fact comes, uh, fact comes, he just he meets the defendant, and then he just and I just saw that throughout the whole thing, and it was infectious. Yeah. Because by the end, the nurse who is the first person that you meet who's trying to get him to stop practicing because the mm-hmm. doctors have said don't. By the end, she's saying, "Oh, it's Wilfred the Fox. That's she's true. right where he's, he's supposed back. to be. He's That's true. and he's going to defend the next person, yeah. and she's all in." Um, and so I love that. I love that he loves the law and he can't get away from it and it infects everybody else around him with it. And yeah. it's really cool. Um, and then the other thing is just, <laughs> I'll just call it selfishness slash evil of the defendant and his wife. I mean, it's just, they're, they're it's it. I can spoil it. Are we going to spoil it? No, well, well hold no, no, on. No, no, just, no, no, no. You're good. You're good. You're I'm good. I'm just going to say the level it's funny because when it's in black and white and it's in the fifties and they come across so innocent in yeah. some ways, but I'm looking at them going, man, these people, this is, I mean, we did Lincoln lawyer before we're talking about yeah. uh, Roulet, you know, and, and his character who just kind of just streaks of evil throughout. And then I'm looking at this going, you know, if it wasn't in black and white and it was color and it was, and it was Ryan Philippe and yeah. you know, like, I think I'd say the same thing. Like right. they're on the same, they're playing the same game yeah, <laughs> kind of thing. Man, but man. I don't know, man. It's great. I love the the writing is so witty. Oh man. It's it's a mystery, it's a comedy, it's a courtroom drama. It's all of it. I, it's it's fantastic. And Charles Lawton is amazing. Yeah. I mean, he really is yeah. uh, amazing in this. And Playing the role I, of Scrooge I, McDuck. <laughs> um All right. Uh do you want to get into the uh the awards here? Yeah. All right. Uh so What's the best lawyering that you saw here? Oh, did you did you have? Uh, yeah, go, go for it. Oh, bro! Like, so yeah. I mean, we can talk about stuff. <laughs> Let, you don't have to pick your phrase. Like, like, let's talk about some of these because these are there was some good stuff going on. Yeah, I mean, Will Wilfred Wilfred's character, he's in the courtroom, and that moment where something has happened, the the it seems like all hope is lost for a moment. The the case is tanked. I don't know if we want to. We want to just say it. I mean, we've given the spoiler alerts. There's, there's enough. <laughs> yeah, of no, them. I mean, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we find out that in a plot twist, the wife of Vol is going to be the star witness for the prosecution. Right. She comes in and just destroys the defenses, any chance, any hope that they have, you think. And then Wilford, without really missing a beat, without reacting, without, um, well, I mean, he was a little rude, but, but without really losing any composure, just turns and just uses everything against her. Like, I mean, you're married to this other person. You've lied to the defendant. You've lied to the government by, you know, applying for a marriage certificate with the wrong name because you're married to someone else. And um, so then, and then you've, uh, you lied to us when you came in and talked with us. And then now you're in this courtroom and we're all supposed to believe you. And I mean, like he just really does a great job of, of going in on her and it's, it's so good to watch. Let's watch it. Oh, Mrs. Helm, which do you prefer to be called? It does not matter. Does it not? In this country, we are inclined to take a rather more serious view of marriage. However, Frau Helm, it would Frau appear... Frau Helm. <laughs> when you first met the prisoner in Hamburg, you lied to him about your marital status? I wanted to get out of Germany, so... You lied, did you not? Just yes or no, please. Yes. Thank you. And subsequently, in arranging the marriage, you lied to the authorities? I um, did not tell the truth to the authorities. You lied to them? Yes. And in the ceremony of marriage itself, when you swore to love and to honor and to cherish your husband, that too was a lie? Yes. 
And when the police questioned you about this wretched man who believed himself married and loved, you told them. I told them what Leonard wanted me to say. You told them that he was at home with you at 25 minutes past nine, and now you say that that was a lie. Yes, a lie. And when you said that he had accidentally cut his wrist, again you lied. Come on. Yes. And now today you've told us a new story entirely. Who of it? The question is, Frau Helm, were you lying then? Are you lying now? Or are you not, in fact, a chronic and habitual liar? Cut up! the other pill under the tongue. Oh man, and she's got to keep him medicated. My lord, is my learned friend to be allowed to bully and insult the witness in this fashion? Mr. Myers, this is a capital charge, and within the bounds of reason, I should like the defense to have every latitude. I love it. Oh yeah, we love that. My lord. May I also remind my learned friend that his witness, by her own admission, has already violated so many oaths that I am surprised the testament did not leap from her hand when she was sworn here today. I doubt if anything is to be gained by questioning you any further. That will be all, Frau Helm. <laughs> Mic drop. I mean, that <laughs> is incredible yeah i mean and it you know it's too, it's funny too because we're talking about right now great lawyering and and he's in there um you know now trying to turn the jury against her yeah and it's not a coincidence i mean this is the 50s and he switches from calling her mrs vol yeah because that was her name as he knew it before now yeah because that's the defendant's wife it's i mean the defendant's name uh, leonard Vole, and so she was christine Vole, mrs Vole. Mm -hmm. that's how he was referring to her and as she's now the prosecution's witness, and as he's turning her, I mean, it's now Frau Helm. Yeah, yeah. It is, you're German. You're German. You're, are, you know, and you may or may not be a Nazi. <laughs> you are, I mean, oh. and, and you're now Frau Helm. Yeah. And that will be all Frau Helm. Yeah, yeah. Because you I mean, lied to us. Yeah. yeah. And he You're just, a German liar. Yeah, that's what he did. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that was, that was so, so good. Yeah. Um, so going back, big picture. So you've got... Guy is, uh, comes to lawyer's office, says, I've been accused of murder, gets this, gets the story going. He's met this uh, rich woman. He didn't know she was rich at the time, allegedly. Um, starts to court her. Um, she takes a liking to him. And then all of a sudden, she winds up dead. He's the primary suspect. He doesn't really have an alibi. The motive is that in her will, she's left 80,000 pounds to him, which is like the equivalent today of like $725,000 US. A lot of money, yeah. And so he's on trial for murder. The wife comes in. You would think that she would have his back, but she seems like a shady character. Right. So the defense decides they're not going to use her. Yeah. And, and then... The prosecution begins their case, and then here's a surprise witness, and it's the wife. Yeah. And I thought another good piece of lawyering was the prosecutor figuring out that he could call her and overcome the objection coming from Sir Wilfred because of spousal privilege yep. by figuring out that the marriage wasn't valid. Right. And that she, because she has another husband who's still alive, that that marriage is still valid. And this is one of those where Wilfred dropped the ball because he should yeah. have had that, should have known that and oh. everything else. He didn't. Yeah. Um, and so the prosecutor does a good job of even getting her to be able to testify against her husband. Yeah. Oh, so, it, yeah, I mean, good work on the prosecutor's mind. Absolutely. I thought, I mean, I have that down as, as one of the better lawyering moments is that prosecutor getting the wife up on the stand uh, to begin with, um, Wilfred's cross of Christine, we just did, um, the, uh, the prosecutor's cross of, uh, the defendant is really good. Yeah. I mean, he does a good job with them. Yeah. You know, I mean, he really does. And, uh, so, um, you know, it's funny cause we did, uh, uh, a few good men and we talked about, uh, how solid, the prosecutor was uh, Kevin Bacon's character, Jack mm -hmm. Ross, in that one. And in a lot of ways, I felt like you kind of had a similarly competent prosecutor mm -hmm. in this one. Yeah. I mean, you really did. Uh, yeah. And 
And so, because you know, some of the time you get the star defense uh, uh, lawyer who's, you know, uh, kind of shown to be kind of the Mickey Howler type or whatever mm-hmm. from the Lincoln lawyer where he's just, you know, got in here too, but but the prosecutor's just obviously outmatched right. because it's just the government lawyer and he's walking around in the, you know, stained $50,000 salary, old suits, you know, that don't fit and things mm-hmm. like that. Where the defense lawyer looks, you know, all put together and yeah, like me. <laughs> yeah. You bring it, man. I've seen you in court. <laughs> and I thought, the prosecutor here was very competent and able yeah. and did a good job. Yeah. And sort of a commentary on the skill of a good lawyer and a good prosecutor. He, he's very competent and there's nothing really special that s- sticks in your memory about him. No. Yeah. You know, he's just kind of sort of like a really good uh, server, you know, just like he's, he, he attends, he's uh, sort of like, are you doing good now? And just kind of teases things and lets the witnesses do their things brings the case out, but he doesn't really make himself the center of the yeah. attention. No, I think that's right. Another, I think, good lawyering scene was uh, the hearing aid scene. <laughs> yeah. So yes. let's play that real quick. I have not quite finished. You are registered, are you not, under the National Health Insurance Act? Aye, that's so. Four and sixpence are paid every week. Oh, that's a terrible lot of money for a working woman to pay. I am sure that many agree with you. Now then, Miss Mackenzie, did you recently apply to the National Health Insurance for a hearing aid? For, 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 for what? My Lord, I must protest against the manner in which this question is being put. I will repeat the question, my Lord. I asked you in a normal tone of voice, audible to everyone in open court, did you apply to the National Health Insurance for a hearing aid? Yes, I did. Did you get it? No, not yet. However, you state that you walked past a door which is four inches of solid oak. You heard voices, and you are willing to swear that you could distinguish the voice of the prisoner Leonard Vole. <laughs> no further questions. Uh, oh, that's good. I love that. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> the prisoner Leonard Vole. <laughs> <laughs> Who? What? What? Um, <clears throat> she she goes on to try to lobby the judge to help her get the hearing yeah, aid. That's right. So great. <laughs> Maybe you can help me. That's so good. And uh, man, I love that. No, uh, there was another uh, Wilfred objection earlier where um, he thinks the prosecutor's testifying, and he he says, "Really, my lord, if my learned friend is going to answer his own question, his presence of the witness seems rather superfluous." Yes, yes. <laughs> Speaking objections, bring it. Uh, yes, which you know, that. huge. I wonder if that is more. A cultural thing because with parliament you know they're more boisterous and mm-hmm. they they actually mm-hmm. kind of speak out of oh, turn yeah. and things like that so i i wonder if that's you know here we would just say you know objection leading the witness or something like that i wonder if that's accurate maybe if somebody is, is if somebody is a solicitor or a barrister or from the uk and you know about these things give us a shout yeah no that actually would potentially explain one of my other things I noticed about this movie, which is there are probably how many defendant interruptions would you say there are in this where he's standing up and saying, that's not true. I didn't kill her. Why are you saying this? And the judge never says anything for the first, probably three or four of those outbursts, which in, you know, if it was an American courtroom movie, you would see the judge speak up and say, get control of your client yep. or something along yep. those lines. Um, Gavel comes out, tap, tap. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that goes to what you were just saying about the, the culture. Maybe that's just kind of how it goes there. But, um, but, but he did eventually uh, not say, put a stop to the defendant doing that, but he did say, you'll have your, your turn kind mm-hmm. of thing. And, but that was like the fourth or fifth time it yeah. happened before he, before he did that. Um, but no, there's, there is some, some really good, good lawyering uh, in this movie. And then we should say from a legal strategy standpoint, I mean, Frau Helm, Christine Vole takes the cake. 
Like, it was completely <laughs> her strategy to get some off. Oh. It wasn't anybody else's. It was hers. Yeah. Which, <laughs> man, like, just the, yeah, just that, that was, it's brilliant. And at the same time, I'm kind of like, come on, this could have gone bad so many different times. Oh, man. Which he says to her later. He's like, why? Wouldn't you have just trusted me? We could have won this. We honestly, and he, yeah. you know, he's now just, um, you know, he's he's angry at the mockery of the court and yeah. of the law that was made by Used. what she did because she's up there lying and lying and then you know whatever else. Um, he thinks he could have won it straight up, yeah. basically, and that they cheated to win. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was he wasn't cheating, but essentially, he was part of the cheating team to win, right? Um, because yeah, she basically takes what. He tells her at the beginning of the movie, which is, you know, the credibility of the wife here is not going to be that high because mm-hmm. everyone's going to think you have, of course, why would you say anything but supportive yeah. things or, or make up an alibi, which is really what she was going to do. Um, or yeah. And, uh, you know, so, but she comes up with this whole strategy of, well, if my, if they're going to think I'm supportive of him, then the only way I can be helpful to him is if they think I don't like him anymore. Right. Right. And that's her whole thing. So she gets up there and becomes the liar, becomes the, you know, the lightning rod. Um, and uh, and then so they won't believe her. They'll believe him. And uh, it really is pretty genius. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to use that strategy with my clients. <laughs> Just heads up. All right, let's take a quick break so I can let you know that right now Varsity Search has been retained by a construction law boutique in Dallas to help grow their team. This is a tremendous opportunity for an 8- to 12-year partner-level attorney, as well as a 3- to 6-year associate-level attorney. These are well-compensated positions, which provide a lot of client interaction and responsibility. And there's even a Sir Wilfred Roberts Day, where they wear powdered wigs to the office. Oh, probably not. But there should be. I'm going to talk to him about that. So if you or someone you know might be interested, email me, daniel at varsitysearch.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Before we go any further, uh, we, we've mentioned and we've already seen Wilfred in action uh, uh, in the in the courtroom. But I do want to also give a little context to his wit and his humor and his overall personality because, I mean, that is really what kind of sets the tone for the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in the beginning of the of the of the movie, we've got um, this clip here. We're going to play about how we kind of get introduced to him and his nurse on the way home from the hospital. What a beautiful day. I've been hoping we'd have a bit of sun for our homecoming. I always say it's worth having all the fog just to appreciate the sunshine. Is there too much of draft? Shall I roll up the window? Just roll up your mouth. You talk too much. If I'd have known how much you talked, I'd never have come out of my coma. <laughs> this thing weighs it. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. yeah. If you would have... <laughs> I know you're going to talk that much. I would have never come out of my coma. And then you get another taste of it here. That is so well for a time for a little nap. Oh, get out. Ready, <laughs> bye. We'd better go upstairs now. Get undressed and lie down. We? What a nauseating prospect. <laughs> upstairs, please. Are you aware, Miss Plimsoll, that while on my sick bed, I seriously considered strangling you with one of your own rubber tubes? I would then have admitted the crime, retained myself for the defense. My lord, members of the jury, I hereby enter a plea of justifiable homicide. For four months, this alleged angel of mercy has poured, probed, punctured, pillaged and plundered my helpless body while tormenting my mind with a steady drip of baby talk. Come on now, like a good boy. Oh, no. Take your hands off me, Miss Plimsoll. I'll strike you with my cane. Oh, you can never do that. You might break your cigars. Cigars? What cigars? The ones you're smuggling in your cane. Cane? (laughs) She uncorks the bottom of the cane and out come three cigars. Smiles. You could be jailed for this. You had no search warrant for my cane. In hospital, he'd hide cigars and brandy all over the place. We called him Wilfred the Fox. I'm confiscating these. Can't I have just one? No. Upstairs. A few puffs after meals, please. (laughs) Well, I'll do it. Some dark night when her back is turned, I'll snatch her thermometer and plunge it between her shoulder blades. Oh, well. (laughs) Uh, You know, and up till this scene, I struggled with, you know, is he really that much of a jerk? But then I realized it was a dry, biting 
Absolutely. Humor. You know, oh my goodness. So witty. <laughs> uh, we have uh, our other, our next award here is the Aaron Brockovich Award for Best Discovery Moment or Investigative Prep Work. Um, you know, I, I think we talked about Christine's strategy before uh, and she kind of <laughs> took the cake. And, and really, uh, I, I don't have much for this because, again, we don't have a whole lot of... Uh, I mean, we have Mayhew, who's really a lawyer, but he's a solicitor, you know, whatever, um, who I should say kind of had the beat on this the yeah. whole way. Yeah, yeah, he called it. He had it. <laughs> Every time Wilfred was kind of... You know, buying in, buying in to the defendant's story, he'd always kind of look to me. Do you believe him? Eh. <laughs> eh. He was always sort of this. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> He's the Weinberg. Uh, yeah. No, he was. Yeah. But he had it the whole way through. He. he uh, but Christine Volhelm, the wife, mm. writing all those letters. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that in the middle point. of the trial and concocting this whole affair again so she could kind of be um impeached by Wilfred on the stand and again be kind of the enemy that you know uh could then help her husband get off. Mm. Um man, that was the- <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, deep cut. Um I would I would say soft sell too though to the nurse for discovering the cigars hidden in the cane. There you go. Yeah. Well, I had the nurse and Carter just for keeping Wilford healthy through the whole thing. Because <laughs> they're having to keep him medicated. They, yeah. There's a pill every like 20 minutes that he's got to take in. Uh, and he's got brandy sn- uh, smuggled into his, uh, you know, his his little Yeti there. Yeah, it's not a Yeti, but it's supposed to be hot cocoa. It's supposed to be hot cocoa, but it's brandy. Uh, you know, and, the, the thing is about this movie, I wonder if part of me just enjoys it so much because I'm afraid that this is who I'm going to become. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is your, this is you. This is, this is my destiny. <laughs> Bitter cynical. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's so good. Post heart attack. <laughs> uh, do you have any best, uh, judge moments? The Chamberlain Haller award. Ooh. Um, Man, you know, I, I, I think just, oh, okay, yes, yes. Okay, so there's a, a moment where Wilford is late to court. And the prosecutor says something kind of witty about, you know, let the record reflect that, um, Mr. Wilford has decided to join us or something like that. And then the the judge says something else biting back. I can't remember what it was. Oh, uh, was it something like, uh, we'll make note of your interest in his appearance? Or just, there, was, there was something that he said that was kind of witty hmm. that was in retort. And let's see if I can, I'll find it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I already kind of said the the judge kind of preempting the uh, objection for uh, the way the housekeeper was testifying about the books that the widow was reading. Um, and, oh, here's the other thing. It looks to me like he's just got essentially kind of an old school fountain pen that is his gavel, his hammer. Did you notice that? Or what yeah. was he using? Yeah. Because it was making like a gavel sound, but it looked to me like it was just like a pin. Yeah. No, I did notice that. And in fact, there there is a little... There, I thought there was an actual gavel or at least a platform for a gavel that right. was next to it yeah. and, he, and that he just wasn't using it. Right. But it may be that they they just use that that sort of pencil or that pin. But yeah, he didn't, he didn't resort to a, a big hammer. No. No, he had something. Good. For, I mean, he was able to make that gavel sound, but he wasn't using the gavel. Um, the uh, best witness moment, we had the housekeeper on there, and she had several. Um, the hearing aid we heard. Um, she does actually uh, cause some trouble for Wilfred because one of his theories is that she heard 
the victim watching TV in the room. And the housekeeper says, it couldn't have been the TV because the TV was out for repair oh yeah that week oh yeah that was tough man yeah that's the one question too many he yeah he didn't have that nailed down he he needed to have that totally buttoned up and he didn't and yeah. so he obviously he didn't know that that's where that tv was um and this just goes back to for the young lawyers the rule on cross-examination is that you only ask closed questions that you in other words, you don't ask open-ended questions on cross-examination. You only uh, put the answer in the witness's mouth because you're talking to the jury. You don't want to elicit uh, some sort of testimony that you don't know the answer to that's going to tank your case. It only takes one thing. Man, that, that one was um, that one was bad. <laughs> I, do, I do like that she also <laughs> – he got her to say <laughs> she never liked him, uh, Vol, the housekeeper. She yeah. kind of set up her as a – antagonistic to to uh to his client which yeah. is good for just impeaching her um so good for the uh the uh the colonel justice award i think has to go to the housekeeper although there is a case for obviously christine on the stand with her uh you know famous i will not stand here and listen to a pack of lies that letter is a forgery it isn't even my letter paper it isn't no I write my letters on small blue paper with my initials on it. Like this. Holding up all her letters. This happens to be a bill from my tailor for a pair of extremely becoming Bermuda shorts. <laughs> <laughs> the call back to an earlier joke. That's what we call him, and that's what he is. Housekeeper, now, or the Mrs. nurses Howell, on board. Been kind enough to identify your letter paper. Now, if you like, I can have an expert identify your handwriting. Damn you. Damn you. Leave her alone. Damn you. Mrs. Hill. Let me go. Let me get out of here. Let me go. Mr. Hill. <laughs> Runs out there. Asha, give the witness a chair. <laughs> <laughs> Which is another difference. They, their witnesses stand in the witness box. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and they, they do give her a chair there at the end as she's sort of collapsing and having a breakdown. Um, Best judge moment. So when the trial is about to begin, the prosecutor says something to the effect of, I trust that we're not going to be deprived of Mr. Wolford's stimulating presence. And then Brogan Moore stands up and says he's slightly incapacitated. He's going to be a part of the case. He'll be here Prosecutor says, my Lord, may I express my regret that Sir Wilfred is even slightly incapacitated. And the judge says, you may, and you may also proceed with the case for the prosecution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pa, 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 pa. <laughs> Reggae horn. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's do best client moment. And one of our nominees is from this clip right here. Very anxious to interview me since I visited Mrs. French that evening. So, well, naturally, I went along to the police station. Did they caution you? I, I don't quite know. They, they asked me if I'd like to make a statement and said that they'd write it down and that it might be used against me in court. Would that be cautioning me? Well, it can't be helped now. Well, they were very polite and they seemed quite satisfied. They seemed satisfied, Mr. Vole. He thinks that he made a statement and that's the end of it. Isn't it obvious to you, Mr. Vole, that you will be regarded as the principal and logical suspect in this case? I'm very much afraid you'll be arrested. But I've done nothing. Why should I be arrested? I mean, this is England. You don't get arrested or convicted for something you haven't done. We try not to make a habit of it. <laughs> but it does happen, though, doesn't it? Of course. There was that case of that fellow, what's his name, Adolf Beck or Becker. He'd been in jail for eight years, and they suddenly found it was another chap altogether. He'd been innocent all along. You're very unfortunate, but restitution has been made. He received a free pardon, a bounty from the Crown, and was restored to his normal life. Yes, that's all right for him. But what if it had been murder? What if he'd been hanged? How would they have restored him to his normal life then, eh? Mr. Vole, you must not take such a morbid point of view. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Don't take such a morbid point of view. Yeah. Uh, man, he's. Uh, they seem satisfied with the statement. Oh, my goodness. Nightmare. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is time for a segment we like to call The Fifth Amendment. With Callahan and King. 
Hey, listener, do you have a pending murder charge against you? Do you have a crime that's pending against you that you're innocent for, or maybe even one that you committed? Do the police want to come in and have you make an incriminating statement against yourself? Is there a possibility that you could spend life in prison or worse if you say the slightest thing wrong? Well, call Callahan and King today. Our curriculum will teach you to utilize our patented STFU methodology. That's S, stop what you're doing. T, think about the long-term consequences of your plan. F, find your way to our office. And U, under no circumstance, talk to the police without your attorney present. Try our STFU methodology because we guarantee that you couldn't handle things any worse if you tried. Legal disclaimer, this advertisement does not constitute legal advice, but seriously, shut up. Plead the Fifth Amendment STFU curriculum is trademarked by Callahan and King. Copyright 2020. Your mother goes to college. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. I, You know, it just it's, it's a comical representation of so many conversations that I've had where the client comes and talks to us after they've talked to the police. Oh yeah. Which at that point in time, you know, the genie is out of the bottle. Right. And it's so hard to undo the mistakes that have made because you don't know what the police are looking for. They could simply be wanting to be able to cooperate that you were at the scene of a crime Mm. and, and ask you about all these other things and have you thinking, Oh yeah, well I never said that and I never did this and I never grabbed this thing. But they got you when they got you to admit when you were at the scene. So just plead the fifth. Yeah. No, there you go. Oh, can Give we... any other client moments. That was, a re- that was a good client moment. Yeah. I mean, within that same one, there's a commentary to be made about wrongful convictions in the criminal system. Um, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a funny uh, way of looking at it. But, you know, he says, this is England. You don't get arrested or convicted for something you haven't done. And, I mean, that is such the um, idealistic view of um, the the system and it is so misguided there are so many horror stories the the most notable one in Texas being the Michael Morton uh, situation and of course from that we have the Michael Morton Act um, and the the statement where Wilfred says, well, look, he's, he's got his restitution. He's, he was in jail for eight years, but he's got a free pardon. And, right. And, and so now he, he's been restored to his normal life. Oh, well, yeah. great. Yeah. Just, hey, do over. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Bounty from the crown. Yeah. Makes it all better. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> yeah. But I, I think that Evola is such a good manipulator and i i hate oh, to give credit for that but you you have to and oh yeah i mean just the way that he 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 plays dumb which oh clients please just tell your lawyers the truth they need to know from the beginning um but just uh, you know telling them i don't know what this is about and i and what money she had money what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> oh that's a good point he, he, he finds out that he he finds out he finds out in quotes uh, in the lawyer's office that he's inherited the money, and he immediately starts to run over. I need to call my wife yeah. and tell her this is great news. <laughs> oh, wait a minute! <laughs> this might not look so good, huh? And then Wilfred's like, I wouldn't think so. No, uh, I bet they'll be arresting you any moment. And he I'll looks look- out the window, and there they are. <laughs> Here they come now. Coming to get you right now. <laughs> oh, the sheriff, we're in here. Come on in. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, man. That was so good. Uh, all right. Let's take a brief recess. We we talked about, uh, I'm glad we did, Barrister versus Slister, because I, I did have that as a, uh, as a recess uh, story. And so uh, we've covered that. The uh, I do want to say, the whole... The whole scene, and it's a fairly lengthy scene, of how uh, Vol and Christine met during mm. the war. Yeah, to me, is just a weird scene. Yeah, and almost seems totally out of place in the movie. I mean, I get that we kind of had to have something to kind of put them together and kind of yeah. show their two peas in a pod in some ways, and you kind of learn later. Yeah, that they kind of both are are are, are, are just 
you know, they're kind of a match yeah. um, in some ways, but I don't know. It's, it's a weird scene. It's odd. It is. I didn't expect her to be playing the accordion. You know, I, I did not think that that would be the song is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, and, and he's, you start to, you see him kind of, it's the first, cause up until then you've seen him as this sort of, uh, naive, surely it won't come to me. I didn't do anything. But in that scene, you do see him in total control. Yep. He's confident. Mm-hmm. He's arrogant. He's a manipulator. He's manipulating her. Um, and she's also giving it back to him. So he's kind of found his match in some ways. No. Um, but uh, yeah, so so I, I get why it's there. It, but it is just a weird scene. No, it didn't really flow. I didn't, I didn't love it. And uh, anyway, so that's why it's in the recess here and not in the actual case for this movie because I wouldn't put it in there <laughs> um what's your favorite scene let's talk or not what's your favorite what are some of your favorite scenes um you know i'd love when <laughs> vol comes to wilfred's office and they're interviewing them and it's right after these moments i think that we've played earlier where he's trying to determine whether or not he can trust vol and so he puts the monocle on Oh, we got to have the monocle conversation. Oh my goodness, y'all. You you have to see <laughs> what this. What's happening here? <laughs> the reflection from the sun outside is bouncing off the monocle and he's using it like a spotlight to interrogate the defendant in order to say, you know, like put him under pressure and, and make him kind of uh, feel stressed and like, okay, so why should I believe you? And he's cross-examining him and the, and the guy just, Vol really shines through it. But the monocle is shining the whole time like a spotlight. And it, and, and this is where you really see the 50s movie production because it's some <laughs> stagehand with a flashlight yeah. right behind the camera just shooting a flashlight in their face. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it's like moving around kind of like it's the, the, like the person's hand is shaking. Yeah. Um, it's really great. Uh, I'm still – it's it's and he's almost treating it like a lie detector test. Yeah. And we don't really see anyone fail it, so I'm not sure what it would look like to right. fail his monocle test. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, he gets it wrong twice. Right. And I, I love that <laughs> so, that uh, Brogan uh, later is uh, Brogan Moore is talking to him later, and he said, "How do you do on the monocle test?" Yeah, that was that's a thing. <laughs> yeah. So everybody, we know. Yeah. <laughs> Did you put him through the monocle test? <laughs> That's, that's the, great. But then the wife, when she comes in and he tries to do the monocle test with her and she pulls the shade down on him. Yeah. Which maybe that's, maybe that's symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll pull the shade down this whole thing. She's like, I'm not falling for it. No, 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 no. Um, uh, maybe you'd be more comfortable without the sun in your eyes. I'm going to pull the shade down. <laughs> oh man. Can we talk about some differences in the U S trial uh, yeah. advocacy or U.S. Yeah. courtrooms and theirs. Sure. So the wigs, number one. Yeah, which I I saw. I I couldn't quite tell. You were saying your friend said that they still do that, and it seemed to me that that was something that is done in some courts, maybe some jurisdictions, maybe not as much in others. So I don't know. Um, yeah, but the powder works. And when Wilford gets home from the hospital and into his office. That's the first thing he wants to see. He's pulling that out of the <laughs> lockbox to, to check out his wig, make sure it's still ready to roll for him yeah. the next time he's in court. I can't remember where I saw this. I thought it was in my conversation but uh, with my friend, but I, there was somewhere where they, I thought I saw someone say that those wigs are like 30,000 pounds. What? I, I, Whoa. I, maybe I read it. I don't know, but they're, apparently they're really expensive. Wow. Um, All right. So That's, I would explain why it's kept in the, box they had it in there yeah so they've got the the prisoner's box okay so yeah the, which they refer to the defendant as the prisoner yes oh my goodness <laughs> how do you like that <laughs> presumption of innocence <laughs> <laughs> and so the whole time the the two guards are flanking this guy on the left and the right as he's looking at the jury yep. and he's he's in the guilty box and he's and he's just supposed to just look there, stand, sit there, and look innocent. There's the witness stand, um, rather than the witness chair. Right. Um, man, three women were serving on the jury. Did you catch that? Were there three women? Three women. Okay. Nineteen twenty-seven. So did a little research. Um, whatever the internet is can teach me quickly without really pursuing it. But it looks like in England, as early as the nineteen twenties, women were serving on juries. Hmm. 
Contrast that to the U.S. and this uh, 1879 decision, the Supreme Court confirmed that a state may constitutionally confine the selection of jurors to males. In Utah in 1898, um, Utah became the first state to deem women qualified for jury duty. But even as late as 1927, only 19 states in the U.S. allowed women to serve. It was only the 19 Civil Rights Act, sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 that gave women the right to serve on federal juries. And it wasn't until 1973 that all 50 states passed similar legislation. Wow. Man. Yeah. Different times. Different times. <laughs> oh. Other scenes. Uh... Oh, some, yeah. Oh, there's a point where. Brogan Moore is talking to Wilford, I think, about the defendant and what they can expect from this case. And they say he's got one foot on the gallows and another on a banana peel. Yep. <laughs> this, these are these are now quotes that are I'm going to be incorporating into the common vernacular of our office. <laughs> and then at the end, uh, Wilfred says, well, we've we've got him out of the gallows, but we still haven't figured out the banana peel. Yeah. Because he knows something's wrong. Yeah. After yeah. the verdict, he knows something's wrong. Yeah. And he hadn't figured it out yet. Did you catch that Williford strenuously objects? He does. He does. We have a strenuous objection. Yes, that's right. Call back to a few good men. That's where Joe Galloway got it, I think. <laughs> she she saw it right out of... If I strenuously... It worked for Wilford. Why wouldn't it work for me? You know, I didn't think about the fact that going back to A Few Good Men, her name was Galloway, maybe? Mm -hmm. There's like yeah, a... Yeah, Joe play, Galloway. Galloway. Joanne Galloway. So, okay. So like Gallo, Callow... Yeah, it's, go, it's, it's all this is like it six, all connects yeah this is the six degrees yeah. of my Legal cousin Vinny. yeah, yeah cousin there Vinny. you go <laughs> um blood is thicker than evidence that's right i like that quote yeah no absolutely uh well and then we haven't really talked about yet and this might is a good time as any to talk about the final scene because it is and and we we talked about it with the trailer because they really went overboard to protect the ending of this movie from getting out when in the movie was released. And, and obviously in 2020, it sounds ridiculous because there's just absolutely no way you could do this mm -hmm. with social media and everything else. Yeah. But in 1958, you could, and you could uh, basically keep this all under wraps. Yeah. And uh, so the multiple twists at the end um, where you've got a, a not guilty verdict. Yeah. Um, so we think we've at least, that may be the end. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, w one of the pieces that kind of comes out that doesn't quite seem relevant during the trial is this whole, to, the, to everything, is this whole notion of uh, Vol with another woman yeah. uh, at a travel agency looking to book a trip. Right. And uh, that winds up becoming, okay, now... Uh, that did happen. And, right. and after she's got her husband off by doing all this work, <laughs> she, she now finds out that he is having an affair. He does have this a thing going with this younger woman. Yes. And he's about to walk away with her. Oh my goodness. I mean, and he's in stabbing her right in the back, right? In, well, right. in the front in, in court. Yeah. Uh, everyone's <laughs> they're still in the courtroom and, and everybody else is gone, but they're still there. And man, it, it's just after all she's done for him and his response, yes. this trite response is, well, I saved your life getting you out of there or back however long, 20 years ago, uh, getting you to America or getting you to England. Yeah. And, and, uh, now you saved my life and we're Steven. Even. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to run off with her. Oh my goodness. And then the wife gets upset. Grabs the knife that grabs was the knife evidence from evidence that's just sitting on the table. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to secure the evidence stabs here. Stabs him right there. And stabs him. And and so it's like a multiple twist ending at the end, um, which interestingly enough, in the original story and in the original play, the last piece to that, her stabbing him, was not in there. Huh. And Agatha Christie, after the story was written and published and out, and after the play was, she became unhappy that he was getting off. Mm. he didn't like it she didn't like it yeah and i guess in a lot of her work and i haven't read a lot of her stuff but um that ultimately the uh the wrongdoers usually get their due at the end mm. and so for whatever reason originally she hadn't written it that way and she didn't like it and so they added she added the twist 
at the end with the wife stabbing the husband and uh, getting final revenge. Clever. And then, I mean, I say that that's the final twist. The, oh, yeah. This is is uh, Wilfred saying, we are now going to be in defense of Frau Helm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll be, so he's back at yeah. it again. Yeah. He's, he's going <laughs> to represent the wife now at the end. Oh, so my great. goodness. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> boom, just head boom, spinning, boom. seven twists. In yeah. One. Yeah. And then did you catch that as the credits are rolling, there's actually an admonition and it tells the audience, yeah. don't spoil it. Yeah. Don't talk about Fight Club 1957. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're doing spoiler alert warning in 1957. Don't tell don't your tell friends anyone. you're spoiled the ending. Yeah. Oh. No. And I, I think they had flyers up. I think mm-hmm. they had, this is old school. So you had movie attendants, you know, that would show you just your seats. Yeah. So I think they made announcements from the stage beforehand that you could not share, um, uh, the ending with people and, and all of that. And then even the actors themselves. And I don't think knew exactly how the script, like I, I, the whole production, I don't think they knew, exactly how the ending was going to go until like the very, very end of the production. It's all segregated. And, and yeah, so they, they try to keep it even a secret from as, as much as they could, even yeah. from the, the production group and stuff. So yeah, um, pretty crazy, pretty wild. Um, and, and how you could do that in the fifties and you just, you couldn't, you couldn't do that yeah. today. I mean, you know, even in you, I th- did, was it, uh, was it this movie or another one where you were referencing, uh, uh, Oh, um, I see dead people. Yeah, uh, that, <laughs> yeah this one, the Sixth uh, Sense. Sixth Sense, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's almost like, I mean, that that's sort of the 2001 version of this. Yeah. That's 19 years ago, 18 years ago. Um, but I mean, even then, we didn't have social media, but we had the internet. Mm. It was pre-social media, but it was internet. Right. And, and, and I mean, you had, I mean... I see dead people. Everybody knew what that was yeah, everywhere. a yeah. minute after the movie came Good out. Point. Like yeah. you, even then you didn't have, you wouldn't have been able to keep a lid on right. an ending that like breaks. that, like that. Yeah. yeah I mean, he, yeah. And so it's just interesting how back then you could do that. And they really went to the great lengths to do it. Um, wow. Pretty amazing. Um, the other scene that we hadn't talked about yet is when, and this is actually, a, I mean, I did not know it was her. No. When Christine gets all bar. totally dressed up in the oh. bar and pretends to be, essentially an informant yes um who's got the goods on the wife yeah uh and and creates this whole fake narrative yeah uh, of a of a you know an affair or something like that and that's where the letters come into play and and she's gonna pitch it to wilfred and he takes it hook line and sinker at the bar and she's i mean (laughs) i kid you not did you know that was her i know i thought it was a man in a wig yeah, I mean, she I was all not. decked out. I, different. She got the Cockney accent going yeah. and all whole thing, and um, it, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, she went all in. She got she put a scar on her face, right? Different makeup. She had like her, her teeth were messed up. I, and I think I could I watch when watching it back even here just now a little bit ago was you could kind of see a little bit of like the extra layering of around her the makeup that they did around her chin and stuff like that. And I, um, but at the first time through, I didn't nope. know it was her. Um, I mean, yeah, so, so her, her having to go through and do that whole thing, um, on top of writing all the letters that she, cause there was like 10 or 12 letters or something like that, that she sold to them basically. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a good point. She made money off of it. <laughs> What'd she make 50 pounds or something like that? She started at a hundred and settled for 40, I think. Um, that was pretty awesome. Oh man, that's good stuff. <laughs> So can we can we uh, run the Bechtel test? Can yeah. we talk about that? All right, a quick break here to remind you that each Monday is a Monday Mentors episode where we visit with a Texas lawyer with an established practice and ask them to share advice on how you can grow as a lawyer and reach your career goals. This past Monday, we talked with Houston trial lawyer Cody Stafford, and this Monday, we are talking with Dallas litigator Joel Bailey. Now, I did not ask their advice regarding Brandy in the courtroom but I think we can assume their answers. <laughs> Please subscribe to the show so you can catch these as well as our next Movie Verdicts episode. All right, let's get back to Witness for the Prosecution. So we were going to run the test. Yes, the Bechtel test. Okay, so the Bechtel test, okay, also known as the Bechtel-Waller test for any movie, all there has to be are two women right. talking to each other. About? Something other than a man. <laughs> Do we have that here? I don't think we do. (laughs) 
because uh, we have the nurse talking to who we later learn is the mistress of right. Vol. Right. But they are talking about either Wilfred, Wilfred or Vol. Yes. At one time or another. Right. I don't think they're ever talking about anything else. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I think the secretaries in the office maybe talk to the nurse or vice versa, but I think they're always talking about Wilfred. Wilfred. Um, I can't think of a... Because, yeah. I mean... I mean, she's got, I mean, obviously she, she has, a, the nurse has a significant role in the, in the movie um, and does talk to a couple of different women, but I think it's always about one of the men. Yeah. So. Wah, wah. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. So. Fail that one. Now. All right. It being February. Yes. When we're recording this. Yes. All right. So. <laughs> right. In, in honor of Black History Month. Right. Okay. Because February being Black History Month, the shortest month of the year. We have what I'm now See, calling... See, I like the way you did it that time. Because that time you started with Black History Month and then went to the shortest month. You, the last time you said, it's the shortest month of the year. So what must that mean? I don't know. It could mean a bunch of things. <laughs> oh, this is a little subtle commentary. Okay. A little, little drive-by on culture. That's all right. So... We're all friends here. So we have what we call the Callahan hair test. Right. All right. And this is not referring to my hair. We're talking about us. Yeah. All right. And this is just all you have to do. Uh, this is a, a diversity representation test. Okay. For African-Americans, all you have to do is have a black person. Okay. We're done. That's that's. A, <laughs> oh, we failed. <laughs> we're done. Huh. That's, that's it. This, oh, my gosh. This, <laughs> We failed. That was quick. We didn't get to step two. <laughs> Did we get to step one B? <laughs> nope. the, for future reference, the test is you just have to have one black person talking to another black person about something other than a white person. Mm. And so yeah. it just did not happen in this movie. I struggled there. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, although in fairness, okay, this is a black and white movie. It okay. Is. So for those that don't see color, Right. Right. Then. <laughs> no, she don't see color. Yeah. Right. That's what we were all thinking. Okay. I don't see color. I just see. <laughs> I, this is what all movies look like. That's for me. right. <laughs> oh, it's great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yellow Highlight Award for best line in the movie. Here oh. are a few things uh, that I've got here. Uh, some of them we've talked about already, some of them we've heard in the clips. Um, but I, so I won't redo some of those. Those are some of my favorites that we've heard already. Um, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Pim, uh, Pim, Plimsel says he was not discharged. You know, he was expelled for conduct on becoming a cardiac patient. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, Wilfred says, I'm, I'm constantly surprised that women's hats do not provoke more murder. <laughs> That's one of the little gags is the, the one, the victim had a, uh, big tall hat that she wore uh, in the movie in front of him yeah, uh, and uh, that he had ha- helped her buy earlier. Mm. Um, anyway, that was, that was a good one. Um, I like when Vol says this morning, I had no lawyers at all. And now suddenly I have three. <laughs> yeah. We should explain that I have very little money and I shan't be able to pay all the costs and fees. And Wolford says, we'll get a fourth lawyer to sue you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what about you? Yeah, uh, those are so clever. Um, you know, almost anything Miss Plimsel says, she's is, great. Is golden. She's delightful, you know? and uh, as we said, interesting the chemistry. They're they are married, and so, <laughs> but uh, and she's great. Yeah, absolutely. I think the one that's going to stick with me the longest is "Blood is thicker than evidence." Mm. That's just so applicable. Just when you've got that idealized uh, view of a case that despite all evidence, um, the family members are going to, um, overlook the, the realities of the, of the case and possibly the dangers. And so that just, that rings true now. Yeah. I think that, I think that's right. Um, I think my fi- favorite line of the movie, uh, best line of the movie is, uh, we heard it earlier, but is, uh, she's already violated so many oaths. I'm surprised the Testament didn't, didn't leak from her <laughs> hand when she was sworn <laughs> here today. I doubt if there's anything to be gained by questioning you any further. That will be all Frau Helm. <laughs> and just again, hammering that Frau and the Helm. And, oh. you know, she was Christine Bull uh, at the beginning. 
uh no good stuff good stuff uh best performance by an actor playing a lawyer the gregory peck award mm. i mean is this anything other than broughton i mean he's just, it's gotta be him it's gotta be him he's he's although i should say similar to jack ross and kevin bacon in the last one the prosecutor did a good job today but like you said he was more of an invisible, mm-hmm. competent mm-hmm. waiter in a lot of ways. Garnish. That was good. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that was well said. Um, all right. Any problems we have with this thing? Um, <laughs> besides that it fails all of our tests. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, mo- modern day, it's a different movie, different sentiment in 1957. Yeah. But you know, there's today there's a little, little touch of racism um, with the the German and British conflict, cultural sure. conflict. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a point where I can't remember if it was the um, Mrs. Oh, the 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 Scottish um, maid. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. She, I think she said something about how like their boys shouldn't be mixing with, mm. or our boys shouldn't be mixing with the Germans or something yeah. like that. Right. Um, you know, a li- little bit of, um, teasing of spousal abuse, you know, like there's a point where Wilfred raises the cane to the nurse. That's, mm-hmm. uh, just, you know, plain abuse. But then you've got towards the end when they're in the courtroom and, um, Vol has been found not guilty and the wife is learning that he's got this affair with pretty young thing. Yeah. And, the wife is grabbing onto him and begging him, what are you doing? And then he pushes her off and she falls across the yeah, table. Yeah, she does. I mean, yeah, not, not a great look. Not great. <laughs> no, like I said, I mean, Vol and Christine are brutal. Yeah. Like, I mean, they're like, I mean, let's not forget that. And we don't really know exactly how it came about because it never really comes out um, other than, he apparently hits her over the head with some blunt object to mm. kill her. We don't really know the Good circumstances point. under the murder itself, but he yeah. murders her in cold blood, apparently. That's true. Because it's not like in the heat of passion or fight. At least there's nothing in the movie that says that. So he just, you know, I, apparently for once the will's changed and he's in it, yeah, kills her. Yeah, he's a black widow. And, <laughs> and then uh, allows his wife, who I guess he doesn't love, obviously to go through all she did to get him off and then is going to run away with the, with the, I mean, just brutal. Yeah. And I kind of get the impression like this isn't the first time. Yeah. You know, I like got the same impression. Yeah. He uses helm to get him off of murder and there's kind of a mutual using of one another. There, there. Is. But then, you know, there's the, the new woman and that's just instantaneous and the new woman just seems to be cool with it. Oh yeah, yeah he was she's like, fine. He he committed a murder. <laughs> I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah, they're all falling all over themselves for Vol. Oh, that was a lot. That, from a trial strategy standpoint, we didn't talk about this. There was a little post uh, day in court debrief after Christine testified, where they're talking in in his office, in Wolford's office, uh, the two, the lawyer, this, uh, him and the solicitor, and they're saying they liked him but didn't believe him. And they didn't like her, but they believed her. Yeah. I, I thought that was an interesting observation yeah. of the two witnesses. Because that does feel like what it was, is yeah. that he's charming, he's slick, mm-hmm. they all like him, mm-hmm. the girlfriend obviously likes him, but the gallery does too. Right. But they don't believe him. Right. But vice versa for her. I mean, she's up there. It's designed to be, she's designed it to be, she's not very warm and, you know, they, she doesn't want them to like her, mm-hmm. but, but yet they believe her. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I had a law school professor that told me when we were in practice court that a jury may not remember what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And I wrote that down somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Uh, as all Baylor lawyers did. Yep. And so the yeah, that that concept that even though the jury probably didn't believe him, yeah. they liked him. Yeah. And that won the No doubt. No doubt. Uh, absolutely. 100%. All right. Inadmissible evidence. Just got a few things. Alfred Hitchcock once said that people would come up to him saying how much they liked his movie. Okay, I saw this. This is not his. <laughs> well, I, 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 I didn't. I didn't see the commentary, but I saw 
I when I when I saw Lawton for the first time, I thought, "Is that Alfred Hitchcock?" It does kind of look like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people thought because this does have a Hitchcockian feel to it as mm-hmm. a movie, and they thought it was his. Um, Lawton <laughs> uh, faked a heart attack in his home pool to practice playing this character, and didn't tell <laughs> his oh. wife. Elsa Manchester, uh, who had to pull him out of the water. Oh, my goodness. Um, and then, obviously, probably let him have it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the original story, the original story from Agatha Christie in the play version does not include Miss Primsel. Um, so huh. that's a whole different thing. Yeah. Have her. I mean, she's definitely there. To, she adds a lot. Uh, adds a lot. And uh, you wouldn't like it as much, I don't think, without her. Um, so... Uh, for the role of Vol, the defendant, at the time, these are everybody. William Holden, Gene Kelly, Kirk Douglas, Glenn Ford, Jack Lemon, and Roger Moore. Mm. So, Roger like, Moore? Yeah. The, the, Bond. So, yeah, we got Bond uh, ready to roll here um, for, for Vol. Uh, Ava Gardner and Rita Hayworth for the role of Christine mm. were others. So this is what I'm really excited to say on the show, that Ben Affleck has the rights to this for a reboot what? where he's going to direct and star in this movie. It's happening. Wow. It is happening. And I'm excited about it. I really am. Okay, I think but, be... but how do we feel about it? I, I'm, I'm excited about it. I don't know. I don't, is... I, it, you know, Ben Affleck, can, he's in a hot, I would say, pretty hot mode right now. He went through a real low. Wait a minute. Wait, and so, is he hot right now? Isn't he? I mean, post-Justice League? I don't know. Come on. That? No. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> Are we back down? Well, yes. <laughs> here's where I'm saying he had a, I will say he had a high, he had a low, and he had a reboot for sure. Like a. And a, won like an Oscar. Like and a then. Phoenix rebirth on yeah, his back. Yeah, yeah. And now maybe he's going back down. I don't know if this movie's on the way down for him or on the way up. <laughs> but I'm excited about it. I hope it's good. I will see it. Okay. And, uh, I don't know. I assume he's playing Vol, but I don't know that. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. It doesn't say, but he definitely has the rights to it. Um, and uh, he and some others. I mean, Matt Damon is going to produce as well. I don't know if he'll be in it. Um, now that could be good. So I'm excited. Matt I think Damon. this movie needs a reboot. Yeah. What well, did you for see? For some this? of the things we talked about today. <laughs> Let's see if we can pass a couple of tests. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, one, for nothing else. Did you see there's one that was released in like 2017, 2016? Yes. Now I didn't watch yeah. that. And there was a TV version as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. So they've done a couple of things with this. So um yeah. There is some sort of uh whatever you want to call it, uh not conspiracy theory, but just thought about at the end of the movie, we talked about Christine grabbing the knife that if you pay attention, uh, Wilfred's monocle shines the light on the knife (laughs) and whether or not he's doing that intentionally because he's pissed and he wants her to take him out. I don't know. That's true. (laughs) I I will go back and watch that. (laughs) That's going to be like the wizard of Oz, where if you start the soundtrack at a certain point on pink Floyd's, the wall. Yeah. It tracks. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, we already talked about that. We didn't have the, the murder at the end. Uh, as, as, as uh, Wilfred called it, it was an execution. Mm. <laughs> um, we didn't have that in the original story. We said that. Uh, all right. So um, anything else before we give our verdict on this? Yeah, a couple of things. So yeah. um, things that do age well, commentaries that are being made. So lawyers are known for having chronic health conditions, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, yeah. heart attacks. Um, as well as different vices, drug addiction, alcoholism, um, because of the stress and the pressure. And this deals with it in a comical way, but still um, addresses it. And I I think that there really is part of me that sort of realizes, okay, yeah, we're laughing at this, but there's there's something serious to to be aware of here. Yeah. Um, the, the cynicism, that's another danger. You know, this is a comical, uh, commentary on how lawyers become sort of cynical, cold hearted cynicism to some degree. Skepticism maybe is, is good and it's healthy. Um, but I mean, uh, Lawton, his character, Wilford just becomes a, a cranky old mean man. Yeah. Um, and that danger exists there too. Um, 
you know, client dangers, uh, the, the clients thinking that they can talk their way out of an arrest and the commentary that we had on right. that early, earlier. Um, and then, um, you know, there's, there's something here to be said to, we, I think that we're probably, as we're going through these movies, we're probably going to keep running into ethics and morals. And, yeah. um, I think it's worth talking about it. I'm going to make a plug for a book. If you are a lawyer, aspiring lawyer, young lawyer, old lawyer, doesn't matter. There's a great book called the lawyer's calling by Joseph Allegretti. And he basically, um, is a lawyer that's doing civil law, feels like a hired gun and gets burnt out says, I'm going to seminary gets to seminary and finds a whole bunch of burnout former lawyers <laughs> who, who couldn't figure out how to reconcile their, their faith with their, their code. And so he's like, well, there's gotta be a way to reconcile these two. Yeah. And so he spends a whole book just sort of going through the thesis. How do you do that? He sort of maps out, Hey, there's four types of lawyers. Um, and he says the first one is an either or approach lawyer. And this is the, the lawyer that says, I can either have the code or my morals, but I can't have both. Mm. And they, they have that, that tension, that struggle. And so, you know, they, they leave one or the other, they leave their faith or they leave their, their practice. Um, the second is the no distinction approach. This is a lawyer that doesn't see the conflict. They feel like I'm hired to do a job. Um, I don't see a moral conflict here. You know, my job is my job. Uh, my life is my life. I can compartmentalize all of those things. Um, so Monday through Friday, I can be a lawyer and then Saturday and Sunday I can be someone else. Um, and then the tension model, they see the conflict. They realize that there's a problem with going to work and tearing people down and being, you know, just a bad person um, in court and then going to church and, you know, worshiping on Sunday and being a community leader on Saturday. Um, but they don't know how to reconcile the two. And so they slowly end up becoming the no distinction approach model where they compartmentalize their life. So, oh, that was weird. Uh, so where good. we where we end up with is uh, the final approach, the the aspirational approach is missional living. And the idea here is that you realize that your code or your your faith, your morals are the umbrella under which everything else exists. So you're. Uh, role as a, a lawyer, your role as a uh, owner of a business, your role as a uh, member of society that's contributing to the community, as a spouse, as a parent, as you know, a friend, whatever have you, all are defined by your your faith and your morals. And so therefore, uh, the idea is to integrate all of that. And then he sorts of talks about like, how do you go about doing that? So Highly recommend um, anyone in the law practice or thinking about it, check that book out. Um, I think it applies to other disciplines as well. But um, going and sort of applying this to Wilford, you know, he has this just unreserved devotion to his client. And that even shows up when at the end of the movie, he feels like I owe something to Frau Helm. And so I'm going to represent her. And, you know, as disdainful, he, he does take the case on, I think, because he feels like he should believe in the client. Um, but um, I think that he, he has this admirable quality of, I want to do the right thing. I want to see the right thing done. Um, and so we don't get a whole lot about his, his personal code, his, his faith or his morals. Um, but I think that he's at least, um, worthy of praise in that he is singularly devoted to his clients and his job and what he's doing. Um, I would probably put him in the no distinction approach or the tension model approach. Hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. Interesting. The, the quote that you brought to my mind that he had, <clears throat> talking about him being devoted to his client kind of to, to the end, to a fault. Um, he says, this is my last case, but until it's over, I'm still a barrister and my client's life is at stake. It's his life that matters. I'll do what it takes. Mm. It's a good line. That's really good. <laughs> That's good. good. Good line. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Robert. Yeah. And I'm, uh, 
I can go first this time and uh, on my gavels. Uh, so let's see, we had um, most recently a few good men where I went, uh, what did I say? 90, 95, 95. Yeah. Did I say 95. Um, I thought I was going to top you. You went 98. I went 95. <laughs> um, I, I do really, really like this movie. Uh, I am going to, and I reset my, my cousin Vinny to a 91. So that's where my two highest are right now. Um, I'm going to put this movie at an 88. Hmm. Um, I, I really like it. Um, I actually do like it better. The other one, it, the one that's over now is Lincoln Lawyer. Um, I do like it better. Um, that surprised me. So I was pleasantly surprised, as you were as, as well with this movie. Like you said, your expectations were low. Um, that's where I'm at. Yeah. I do like it better than Lincoln Lawyer. Um, I still have no regrets about the yeah. corner that I painted myself into with <laughs> my cousin Vinny at 99. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you can move with 98. Yeah. 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 That's so, right. yeah. <laughs> you can't, can't back down now. No. Um, so what did, what do you remember what I said for Lincoln lawyer? I think you said 85 and I think I said 83. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. You went 85 Lincoln lawyer. As a lawyer movie. I'm going to start having that in front of us next time so we can mm. kind of start moving, shifting things around. Right, right, right. <laughs> the rankings. Yeah. Um, I'm going to call this a 88. Okay. Is that what you just said, though? Uh, I did. Okay. I got yeah. I got to I gotta go. I got to top you, so 90. Wow. <laughs> You're always coming on top. You're going to run out. <laughs> <That's> of these. <laughs> You're going to start putting some more. All right. Robert, thanks for being here. Witness for the Definitely. prosecution see this movie if you haven't hopefully by now you've seen it because yes. we've spoiled it for you against charles lawton's wishes <laughs> and uh we'll see you next time